Uh, thank you very much for joining us for another Discover Wildlife evening. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan Free, and I'm the general manager here at Wildlife Worldwide and the Travelling Naturalist. And this evening, I'm joined by the, the very talented uh, Nick Atchison. Um, Nick is not only a very good friend of mine and, and has been for some years now, um, but he is an incredible naturalist and an exceptional tour leader. Um, I, I don't want to give him too many compliments, uh, <laughs> but he is he is a talent. Um, he's an absolute pleasure to work with. Um, over the years, we've worked on trips all over the world um, and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, these days, Nick really likes to try and concentrate on the UK and in particular, his home county of Norfolk, which is what we're going to be hearing about tonight. Now, um, as ever, there will be the opportunity to ask questions, um, and I request that you put any questions into the Q&A forum, and I'll put them to Nick at the end of the talk. Um, there'll also be the opportunity to request any travel plans that relate to the um, tours that Nick leads for us, uh, specifically around Norfolk, and also the Festival of British Wildlife, uh, which Nick will be doing next year up in Agas, up in Scotland, uh, which should be absolutely fantastic. Um, we expect the talk to take maybe around 45, 50 minutes, and then there'll be a, a chance, as I said, for, for questions at the end. Um, but I think it's probably time to hand over to you, Nick. Are you, are you good to go, Tricky? I'm good to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, and a very good evening to everybody. I can't see you, but I'm hoping there are lots of friendly faces in the audience and lots of people I've had the privilege of travelling with in the past. Um, thank you very much to Wildlife Worldwide and Travelling Naturalist for having me. Um, as Dan's just said, we have three departures at the moment in Norfolk, or three different tours to Norfolk, and I'll also be joining the Festival of Wildlife at Agus next year in the Scottish Highlands. But this evening, the focus is on Norfolk, which anyone who knows me will know is my home county. But just a little bit on me, as Dan says, for 23 years, I led tours all over the world. For the first 10 of them, I led tours in Bolivia, which was where I lived, and uh, in other parts of South America. And then for the following 13 years, I led um, tours all over the world, um, on every continent, and have had the tremendous privilege of working with wildlife on all seven continents and on all of the oceans. But the pandemic changed all that. And now, as Dan says, I focus on my home county of Norfolk and the wonderful wildlife of the UK. And in this photo, you can see me on a wildlife worldwide cruise to the island of Mull, where we were joined by these fantastic common bottlenose dolphins. So who am I? I am an ambassador for Norfolk Wildlife Trust, so I do a lot of speaking and presenting and writing on behalf of Norfolk Wildlife Trust. I'm also a trustee of an organisation called Penstock Conservation Trust, where we have two main projects. The first is head starting curlews. These are curlews who lay their eggs on military air bases where the eggs have to be removed and historically they were destroyed. But what happens now is under license from Natural England, the government's nature conservation organization, we take the eggs and we hatch them at Penstorp and we raise them until they're ready to become wild curlews. We have a similar project with corn crakes. The corn crake has become extinct as an English breeding bird, but based at Penstorp for the last 15 years, We've been breeding corn crakes in the wild. Amazingly, this bird here is 14 days old and is already ready to leave mum. Mum will then lay another clutch. And this was just a couple of weeks ago when we moved our adult breeding birds into their winter sheds because, of course, they're migratory birds and they go to Africa. But we release 100 corn crakes a year from our captive breeding population. So I'm very involved in many aspects of conservation in Norfolk and this year I published a book which is called The Meaning of Geese during the winter lockdowns of 2020 into 2021. I cycled on my mother's 42 at the time year old bicycle. I cycled 1,400 miles around, I'm sorry, 1,200 miles around North Norfolk. And I followed our flocks of wintering geese, um, particularly pink footed geese, but also Brent geese and the rarer geese, which turn up with them during the winter. But I'm here this evening to talk to you about nature in Norfolk and in particular about the three tours that we have. But what I'm going to do is take you on a geographical tour 
of Norfolk. And I'll drop in information about which tours you might be able to see particular wildlife on. So Norfolk is hugely diverse. It's one of the largest counties. And because it has one of the longest coastlines for a county, because we're round in shape and we go right from the wash down to the broads, we have immense diversity of coastal habitats. We also have immense diversity of inland habitats. So if you look at the map that's in front of you now, beneath Kings Lynn, Basically, to the south of Kings Lynn and the west of Kings Lynn, you have the Fenland landscape, which historically would have been enormous wetlands. And there are still very, very significant wetlands to the south of Kings Lynn. And it's the wintering area for huge flocks of Hooper swans and to a degree still flocks of Buick swans. And these are tremendously important wetlands for people and for wildlife. To the east of that, so south of Swatham, Watton, down towards Thetford and indeed further south into Suffolk towards Bury St Edmunds, you've got what's called the Brex. And this is the driest part of the UK and really the only place in the UK where we naturally have a steppe environment. So we have very, very cold winters in the Brex. We have very, very hot, searing dry summers in the Brex typically. And that means that we there have wildlife which is more associated both with the Mediterranean and also with the steppe habitats which stretch from Central Europe all the way to Mongolia in Central Asia. Then if you go north of that, you have north of the Fens, you have the Wash. And the Wash is probably the most important estuarine habitat in the UK. Morecambe Bay is pretty much equal, but the Wash has higher numbers slightly of migrant, particularly autumn uh, passage birds and wintering birds. And one of our tours, which is called Norfolk in late summer, focuses on the fabulous diversity of birds which are passing through the wash on their migrations. Some of them are staying in the wash for the winter and some of them are heading as far south as South Africa. More on that in a moment. Then we have the wonderful diversity of habitats along the Norfolk coast, effectively along the flat bit, along the top, you've got sand dunes, you've got salt marshes, you've got freshwater grazing marshes. And then from Cromer eastwards, you've got Ice Age cliffs, which are rubble that was left behind by one of the latest of the glaciations of the Ice Age. And then further south still, as you head towards the border with Suffolk, you've got the Norfolk Broads, which are one of the most important wetlands in the UK and the largest, most extensive and most important lowland wetland in the UK. So we'll start in the Brex and our Norfolk in early summer tour focuses on a lot of the special birds and other wildlife, including flowers and insects which live in the Brex. This is the heartland habitat of the stone curlew in the UK. The stone curlew is a very widespread bird going eastwards into Central Asia and southwards into Northern Africa. But really in, in Britain, the Norfolk Brex is the heartland for this species. There are now around 300 pairs in the UK and a couple of hundred of them are found in the Brex. And we tend to see them at a couple of sites. We visit Norfolk Wildlife Trust Wheating Reserve, which has been a breeding site for stone curlews since time immemorial, but also we are apt to see them at a farmland site nearby where we go looking for another bird I'll show you in just a moment. But the breeding sites for the stone curlew are also breeding sites for common curlews. They're doing increasingly well. In fact, um, as the climate changes and the grassland changes, curlews are more likely to be found in the historic habitat of stone curlews. And this is also breeding habitat for lapwings, which in Norfolk we historically know as green plovers. The When Norfolk Wildlife Trust purchased Wheating Heath in the 1940s, it was purchased as a site for the Norfolk plover, which we now know as the stone curlew, and for the green plover, which we now know as the lapwing. Now nearby, not far south of Swatham, we visit a site for displaying goshawks. This is particularly on our Norfolk in late winter tour. And if we have a bright, clear, cold day when the thermals are going to go up and when the sun hits the top of the forest, then we'll go out looking for goshawks. And when the red kites and the buzzards go up, that's when the goshawks begin to display. And we sometimes see phenomenal displays 
of goshawks. We can hear woodlark at the same site. And also by late February, this can also be a site where stone curlews are already on territory. Stone curlews really only leave for a couple of months in the middle of the winter. They're here well into November and they're often back on territory by the end of January or into February. They're really very, very hardy birds. But this fabulous bird here is a goshawk and one of the most important populations in the country, certainly the most important population in the lowlands of the country is in the Norfolk Brecks. And on a clear day in late winter, we have a great opportunity to see them. Now we're moving slightly to the west. One of my favorite bits of Norfolk is what's called the Breck Fen Edge. And in what's called an ecotone, which is the meeting place of two different environments, you get very high diversity. And on the day in the Norfolk in early summer tour when we visit the Brex, we also pop just over the border into Suffolk. We do have comparable wetlands in Norfolk, but the, the best one with visitor facilities is half a mile inside Suffolk at the RSPB's fabulous Lake and Heath Fen. And this is a superb site for seeing a whole range of Fenland birds and particularly reed bed birds. And at this time of year, we're highly likely to see bearded tits. This, of course, is a male with the pale grey head and the bright orange bill and the big black moustaches. And this is the best time of year. Our Norfolk in early summer tour is absolutely timed perfectly for seeing bitterns. Bitterns are secretive birds. They're often very difficult to see, but in early summer, they're feeding their chicks. This is when they've got chicks in the nest and the adults will fly in over the top of the reed to feed their chicks. They, they can't afford to be stealthy and to slip through the reeds. They need to be going back to the nest. So with up to half a dozen pairs of bitterns breeding at and around Lake and Heath, you have a very, very strong chance of seeing bitterns. And depending on the dates of the tour and how early the summer has come on, you might even see young bitterns. As they begin to fledge, they clamber up into the reeds and beg for, for food for their parents right in the tops of the reeds. And where there are bitterns, there are almost certain to be marsh harriers. This, of course, is a male marsh harrier, a fairly young male marsh harrier. Um, the marsh harrier became extinct as a breeding bird in uh, Britain in the Victorian period, they were hunted out. Victorians weren't fond of predatory species and they hunted out so, so, so many of our native species. But happily in the course of the 20th century, the marsh harrier has returned, but they remain a rarer bird in Britain than the golden eagle. There are probably 500 pairs of golden eagles and there are fewer than 400 nests of marsh harrier in the country. And we say nests because males, such as this one you see here, are promiscuous. They can frequently have two, maybe even three females, each with her own nest, whom they are provisioning. And the males do the majority of the hunting. So in a really good territory, a male might be catching food for easily half a dozen chicks, if not up to a dozen chicks plus the females in the nest. Lake and Heath is also the best place I know for seeing cuckoos. There's a huge, huge population of reed warblers in the reeds and they are nest predated by the cuckoo, which means that you've got a phenomenally good chance of hearing singing cuckoos and seeing the cuckoos fly over the reed bed when we visit on our Norfolk in early summer tour in June. And that's exactly the time when hobbies are returning. Hobbies are quite late breeding birds. And so it's a brilliant, brilliant time for seeing hobbies. Sometimes in flocks, you can see 20, 30 birds, usually in May rather than in June. But there are still usually plenty of hobbies around. They haven't split up and gone to their breeding sites. So we'll see them over the marshes of Lake and Heath Fen. And at this time, they're catching a combination of swallows, which have freshly arrived, and also dragonflies, because this is the time when our first big emergence of dragonflies happens. Now, the water of Lake and Heath Fen and the wetlands of the Fens drains northwards into the Wash. Four great rivers drain into the Wash, the Welland, the Witham, the Neen, and the Great Ooze. And the Great Ooze and the Neen are the two that are the boundaries of the Fens habitat. And the Fens are phenomenally important lowland wetlands, but the Wash is perhaps even more important. The Wash is 
subject to twice daily tides. So it's habitat for marine species. So the first bird that I've shown you here is a red knot. And the knot, K-N-O-T, is named after King Knut, C-N-U-T. And the scientific name is actually Calidris Knutus. And as I'll show you in just a second, this is a phenomenally important bird for the global survival of this Arctic breeding species. But it's also super important for many other wintering waders and passage waders. Here you have a common curlew, around 10,000 common curlews winter around the wash. Bartel godwits are also common wintering birds on the wash and shell ducks are common wintering birds on the mud flats of the wash. But we time our Norfolk in late summer tour to coincide with truly one of the greatest wildlife phenomena of the UK, which is the passage of red knot and also many other species. You can see lots of Eurasian oyster catchers there in the background. At peak times, and in fact, our Norfolk in late summer tour in 2020 was present on the wash at the peak of all counts of not on the wash. We saw 140,000 birds fly over our heads. And what happens is that the knot at this time of year are coming from two places. The knot which winter on the wash are largely from Greenland and Canada, and we can have perhaps 100,000 birds of that population. But at the same time in late summer and early autumn, we have an influx of birds which are bred in Siberia. And the Siberian birds of a different subspecies, though they're not really recognisable in the field, they go down to South Africa for the winter. And so on a really good roost, on a very, very high tide, we might see upwards of 100,000 birds. And the reason they fly over our heads is that on the highest of the spring tides in late summer and early autumn, the whole of the wash is flooded and not don't like to get their tummies wet. So what happens is they fly off the wash and they fly right over the heads of the observers, which includes us on the beach. And then they fly into the pits at Snettersham RFPB Reserve. And this is a photograph taken from the hide of not. This is a slightly later in the season photograph. Sometimes in a year, if the tour does very, very well and the phenomenon is going really well, we'll also have Norfolk in late summer tours, which go well into the autumn, because at that time of year, you can still have very, very high tides and huge, huge numbers of wash not will be pushed off the wa wash into the pits and they stay there for the shortest time possible. They don't like being on land. And what we tend to do rather than cram into the hide where photographers tend to like to go, we stay on the beach. And the reason for this is that if you know about this, when the knot leave the pits, they're unaware of the humans standing on the beach. And so they pour out of the pits in one giant mass and they fly very, very low over observers' heads. And it really is, it's one of those things that despite the fact I've been seeing it my entire life, I still can be brought to tears by it or gasp uh, in amazement at the sheer spectacle of it all. And I had to include this photo. These are pink-footed geese. Now, this is a particularly large flock. There are tens of thousands of birds in that photograph. There is also um, a flock of, or a roost of pink-footed geese on the wash. And as the, the um, pink-footed geese, the first birds arrive with us from the first week of September, and numbers tend to build into December. But as they leave their roosts, either at Holcomb or on the wash, if they fly inland towards Norfolk, the washbirds, when we're there, we may also have a second spectacle of the birds leading, leaving the wash to go inland to feed. But when the pink footed geese leave, they're not leaving because of the tide, because they don't mind floating upwards on the tide. They're leaving because it's time to go inland to feed. And during the winter, they feed typically on harvested sugar beet and also increasingly on harvested maize. So that's very much the focus of our Norfolk in late summer tour, but our Norfolk in early 
uh, in late winter and also Norfolk in late uh, in early summer tours. I'm sorry, that's Norfolk in late winter and Norfolk in early summer tours. They also spend a lot of time around the North Norfolk coast. So I'm just going to whiz you through a number of habitats around the North Norfolk coast and some of the species we can see. Now, I'm a bit of a plant geek, so I couldn't help myself but to include some really special plants. One of the reasons we don't quite hit on the Norfolk in early summer tour, we don't quite hit the peak of the flowering of the sea lavenders, but we do if you come back in July and we can arrange private tours for you if you want to see this spectacle, we have four species of sea lavender. So this is the biggest and by far the commonest of them. This is common sea lavender. This is rock sea lavender and the serious botanists will tell you that there are multiple cryptic species of rock sea lavenders. I politely ignore that because they're all absolutely identical. But this is the really, really special one. This is matted sea lavender, which is really, really lovely with these sort of tissue papery flowers. And it is only found in the UK across the north of Norfolk. It's found from the wash east to where my father was born at Blakeney, and it's found nowhere else in the whole of the UK. So we're very proud of it. And we're very proud of this too. This is a species that's typically in the sandy habitats at the edge of the salt marsh. This is sea heath, which is an absolutely gorgeous plant. And another real Norfolk speciality is this. This is um, shrubby sea blight. And again, the only place in the country where it's found is salt marshes stretching from Northwest Norfolk to Essex. And this is typically a Mediterranean plant. In fact, it's very common if you go, for example, to Morocco and you go to salt marsh habitats in Morocco, salt pan habitats. This is a very common species. On our Norfolk in early summer tour, we might take a walk along some of Blakeney Point, which is a fabulous habitat for wildlife. We'll certainly take a boat trip to the end of Blakeney Point. And Blakeney Point is not just special for its seals and for its birds, which I'll show you in a second, but also for its flora. And this is sea kale, which is nationally a very restricted species. And it's one of only two places in Norfolk where we can see it. And a real flagship species that we see both on Norfolk in early summer and also Norfolk in late summer is this, which is a uh, yellow horned poppy. And that is the emblematic species of our shingle habitat. But really, on a typical wildlife worldwide or traveling naturalist tour, we're looking for vertebrates. And Blakeney Point is most famous in summer for its breeding colony of terns. The bulk of the birds are sandwich terns. And depending on where they are in a particular year, we may have up to 4,000 pairs of sandwich terns. They have this long black bill with a yellow tip. They have a black shaggy crest. This is already quite late into summer, so it's lost some of the shag on the back of the crest, and it's already beginning to go gray on the forehead. But when we see them in June, they've still got inky black uh, foreheads and a big shaggy crest. They've also got very, very long wings, a sandwich turn. I always describe them as being a size three turn with size five wings. So they have a sort of desperate flapping motion. And they've got a very distinctive call. They say, Eric, Eric, a three note call. Whereas this bird here, these are common turns and several hundred pairs of them nest on Blakeney Point as well, alongside little terns, of which several hundred may breed. Common terns have a two note call. They say, kick, kick, kia, kia. and there's also a tiny number of Arctic terns which nest on the point. And Arctic terns say, kia, kia. the little terns, by the way, say, chit, chit, tilly, chit, 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 tilly, chit. and they're very, very tiny, very silvery white, and they have a yellow bill with a black tip. Now, the bulk of the gulls that breed on, Black on Blakely Point are black-headed gulls, and they're very, very good at protecting the terns because they don't like predators. So they fly up and they scare away predators such as marsh harriers or black kites or buzzards. But increasingly, we have large numbers of Mediterranean gulls nesting around the Norfolk coast as well. And in most years, many of them might either nest on Blakely Point or on Sculpt Head Island. And in our Norfolk in early summer tour, we take a boat trip out to the end of the point and we'll also there be seeing seals because we have two species of seal which 
breed in Norfolk and both are found year round here. In summer, this species, the harbour seal, also known as the common seal, which has got the cute rounded face and the V-shaped nostrils and the very innocent, rather round eyes. The common seal breeds in summer, so we're likely to see numbers of them on the end of the point in summer. And this species, the much more snouty, long-nosed, Grey seal breeds in winter and November is the peak for them. But even for them, we're likely to see them around the coast on our Norfolk in late summer tour and also our Norfolk in late winter tour. Now, right round the coast, there's wonderful wildlife to see. All times of year, you can see ringed plovers. This is a breeding bird in summer. They breed on the shingle. They also breed on our sandy beaches, but we see them in large numbers in the winter too. And in winter, they're joined by such species as snow buntings. I was out on the coast last weekend and I had snow buntings fly over me, Lapland buntings fly over me. And at the moment, we've got a flock of 12 shorelarks, which are wintering at Holcombe. And if there are shorelarks wintering, either on the Norfolk and Lake summer tour. If we have it well into autumn, we'll go and look for shorelarks if they're around. And if we, if they're still around, very often they're with us still well into April, we might have the chance to go and look for them in our Norfolk in late winter tour. Now we're moving further around the coast into the wetland areas and both the salt marshes and the freshwater grazing marshes have a phenomenal diversity and also population of wintering waterfowl. This of course is a drake teal. There are thousands of dark bellied Brent geese along the coast. These are Siberian breeding birds. They're usually joined and uh, 10 days ago I saw one with them by pale bellied Brent geese, which might come to us either from Greenland or Canada. Those are the birds that typically winter in the west of the UK, but probably the birds that occasionally join our dark bellied Brent flocks are the ones that breed in Svalbard. And they're the ones that typically winter in Northumberland and on the European coast in the Netherlands. But Brent geese are a typical sight and sound along our coast in winter, and they have this gorgeous throaty burble, is it? <laughs> Deep, rolling, rather Slavic sound. I'm terribly proud of this photo because whereas most of the photographs in this talk, apart from the flowers, were taken by clever people with big lenses. This glaucus skull, which is a common bird that we see, or not a common bird, but a regular bird that we see around the coast in winter and we can see on our Norfolk in late winter. This glaucus skull I took at Clyde by holding my phone up to my telescope. And if there's one around, we'll be sure to make the effort to go and look for it in Norfolk in late winter. Now we're heading further south. I mentioned that the Ice Age cliffs that were left behind by a glacier retreating at the end of the Ice Age. They stretch down from Cromer, well, really from Weybourne through Sheringham, Cromer, Haysborough, and then down to the Broads. And all of this is fantastic country for a lot of species. If we have time, if we're in the neighbourhood on Norfolk in early summer, we might make a quick visit to rock pools. We have an outcropping of the chalk, the late Cretaceous chalk, so that's 70 or 80 million years old. That outcrops at West Runton, Cromer, Sheringham. We might take a uh, moment to nip to the, to the rock pools if we're passing, but all of this coastal habitat is wonderful for observing such species as brown hares, which in Norfolk we know as sallies, and also barn owls. We're really one of the heartlands for barn owls in, in the country country and we might see them on Norfolk in early summer when they're active by day because they're feeding chicks or we might see them in Norfolk in late winter when they're active by day because times are hard and they're desperate for food and like the hare which we call Sally in Norfolk, in Norfolk we call the barn owl billywicks. Now we've headed southwards and we've ended up in the Norfolk Broads and the Norfolk Broads are one of the most phenomenal wetlands that you'll find anywhere in Europe, really. And they're a combination of natural habitat and human made habitat, but that is many hundreds of years old and is therefore very, very precious. 
along the rivers, and there are many rivers through the broads, you have an ancient landscape of grazing marshes and of reed beds and of scrubby willow and alder uh, woods, which we know as car woodland in Norfolk. But the broads themselves, the pits, the lakes, are actually an artifact of human habitation. They were dug out in the Middle Ages. And because it's a very low lying PT area, they flooded with water from the water table and from the surrounding rivers. And that's meant that the broads have filled up with water. And for many hundreds of years since the Middle Ages, they've been hugely important habitat for thousands of wintering birds, for many hundreds of breeding birds. They really are hugely important for a whole range of species. Now, we time our Norfolk in early summer so that it's absolutely spot on for seeing this glorious thing. You may have seen swallowtail butterflies in summer elsewhere in Europe, but they're different subspecies. We have in Norfolk a unique subspecies of the swallowtail, which is called Papilio macaon britannicus, and it's only found in the Norfolk broads. It doesn't even stray into northern Suffolk, where the broads reach down and so we're very, very proud of our swallowtails. And they're very fussy. They're on the continent, most subspecies of the swallowtail. In fact, the swallowtail gets as far east as the northeast of, northwest, sorry, of India. Most subspecies will lay their eggs on a number of different species in the carrot family, but our subspecies, Britannicus, is extremely fussy and will lay its eggs only on a rare plant called milk parsley. And so on Norfolk in early summer, we look for, we're at peak time for the adults. We're a little bit early for eggs, but depending where it falls in the month of June, we have a chance of finding eggs. We'll certainly see the young sprouts of the plant milk parsley, which is where it's going to lay its eggs and where the caterpillars will feed in the summer. Now, when I started leading Norfolk tours a number of years ago, we would make a huge effort to see this gorgeous species. It's one of a number of at least a dozen species of dragonflies that we might see, but this is called the Norfolk hawker. On the continent where it's called the green-eyed hawker, it's much more common and widespread. And as our climate changes, it's one of the species that's winning. It's doing very, very well indeed. And the Norfolk hawker has now spread all along the south coast of the UK as far west as Dorset now, and it's also spreading all over Norfolk. So where we used to go to the Norfolk Broads, which was the only place in the country where it was found, and it's still its heartland, and we're on a good day in summer, we're very, very likely to see it in uh, on our Norfolk in early summer tour. But nowadays you can be safe in the knowledge you'll see Norfolk hawkers elsewhere. Now, no apologies for the fact, I think you need to understand the whole environment, the whole habitat. And so I spend a lot of time, especially on Norfolk in early summer, telling you about the distinctive environments that we visit. And these start, of course, with plants. And we see lots of species of orchids on Norfolk in early summer. This is one of the commonest of them. This is southern marsh orchid. But this is one of the scarcer ones that we usually see around the coast or indeed in the broads on Norfolk in early summer. This is early marsh orchid, which is much, much scarcer. And this is, we have two subspecies of early marsh orchid in Norfolk, and this is the inland one, which is called Dactylorhiza incarnata incarnata. Now I'm showing you this just for its interest value. This is a pretty rubbish photo I took uh, exactly this time of year after the very first frost. And I took this at our Norfolk Wildlife Trust Barton Broad Reserve. And I show it to you because it looks like a stinging nettle, but it isn't. It's actually a separate thing. This is called fen nettle. And at a number of the sites we visit, it's common, for example, at uh, broadland sites like Ranworth Broad, Barton Broad and Strumptual Fen. And this nettle has no sting. So you can cheerfully rub it on your face, on your arms, on your hands, and it looks exactly like a stinging metal. And I watch clients, that I watch the cognitive dissonance going on in their heads because their entire lives they've been going, it's a stinging metal, I can't touch that. And they can see someone cheerfully rubbing it across their face. And it just feels uneasy. It gives you a slightly sicky feel. But this is the lovely fen nettle, which is a real broadland speciality. But talking of broadland specialities, here we have Marsh Harry. This is a female, of course. This is a fairly young female. And the broads, though we will already have seen them 
in the fens in our Norfolk in early summer. We'll certainly also see them in Norfolk in early summer in the broads and Norfolk in uh, late winter. We're highly likely to see them as well, but I'll come on to the reason for that in just a moment. So that's the marsh harrier, about a third of the whole British population. So more than a hundred nests nest here in Norfolk. We really are the heartland for the bird that used to be known as the Norfolk hawk. We're also the heartland for this fabulous creature, the common crane. Much though, wonderful news, the common crane has been reintroduced in the Somerset levels and some of those birds have spread back to where they were raised at Slimbridge in Gloucestershire and they've also started breeding on the Gwent levels in the south of Wales. Norfolk has had breeding cranes since 1982 when the first pair bred. They arrived in 1979, they first attempted to breed in 1981 when they failed and they bred successfully in 1982. And ever since then, in the broads, the population has been slowly building and they've now spread into the fens. And we now typically have a winter roost of around 60 or 70 birds in the broads and a similar number of birds in the fens. So we're getting towards a couple of hundred birds with pairs and adults in the East Anglian population. And we now know also that they're mixing with birds from the Somerset levels. So globally, across the UK now, there are more than 70 breeding pairs, which is completely fantastic to have this once common bird restored to the UK landscape. And in Norfolk, they've done it all under their own steam. Now, uh, one final bit on Heathland. We will visit Heathland on the Norfolk in early summer tour because we have Heathland right next to us, but also the sites that we visit along the North Norfolk coast usually have Heathland just inland of them on the Sandy Ridge, which is called the Hope to Cromer Ridge. But our hotel is fortuitously right between two fabulous Heathland sites. One of them, Dersingham Bog, is a wonderful breeding site for nightjars. I've never seen nightjars in all my years leading trips and watching birds. I've never seen nightjars better. Dersingham Bog is quite, quite extraordinary. And I can feel the presence of people in the talk this evening who've been on the Norfolk and Early Summer Tour with me and seen the nightjars. And despite the mosquitoes at this site, begged me to take them back the next night because it's such a phenomenal display. So that's Dersingham Bog, which is a National Nature Reserve. But just to the other side of the hotel, we also have another National Nature Reserve, which belongs to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, which is called Royden Common and Grimston Warren. And in the wet bits of that, we see this lovely heather flowering in summer, which is called cross-leaved heath. But also there are huge areas of the much commoner common ling or common heather. And this is both a breeding site for many birds. It's a breeding site for stone chats, for tree pipits, for the wonderful woodlark that we also hear. Woodlarks are really best heard, not in summer, but in late winter. So we hear woodlarks in the Brex when we go looking for goshawks in Norfolk in late winter, but we also hear them still both in the Brex and on the heaths in Norfolk in early summer. But really the best reason for our hotel, which is just outside Kings Lynn, is because in Norfolk in late winter, we are surrounded by wintering raptors. There's a roost of raptors on Royden Common and another one on Dersingham Bog. And we go out on a couple of evenings of the tours and we'll see marsh harriers come to roost. We may see short-eared owls come to roost. We might see barn owls hunting in the dusk. We may well hear tawny owls shrieking. We might see peregrines or merlins come into the roost. And we're almost certain also to see uh, hen harriers. Increasingly, we now have another harrier wintering in Norfolk. We've got just one wintering this winter. We have pallid harriers wintering in Norfolk. We had one immature female, first winter female wintering last winter. We have a second winter female wintering this winter, and we believe it's probably the same bird. A few years ago, there was one actually in the roost that we visit on our Norfolk in late winter tours. So I have spoken for 40 minutes and I've wrapped up more or less everything I want to say on the tours, but Dan has one or two other things that he wants to say. And I would love to field questions and to share with you my passion 
for my home county of Norfolk, and also to tell you about the logistics and the practicalities of the tours that we offer here in Norfolk, and to listen to any suggestions that you have for private things that you might like to do. So if you have any questions, I understand some have been dropped in the box, please let me know. Nick, that, that was exceptional. Thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure hearing you talk about the, the, the destinations and stuff that you visited in the past, but to hear you talk about your home patch of Norfolk uh, with, with so much passion and and just in in such depth and and such you know with, with such confidence, it's um it was a wonderful talk. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, yeah, and thanks for the There are um, a few questions which we'll get into Great. very shortly. Um, but before we do that, what we'll do is just very quickly launch the poll, um, just in case any of those trips are of interest. Um, then you can request a copy of the travel plan um, of the detailed itinerary. Um, so if I can just briefly riff on this and summarise the tours, Norfolk in early summer, which is at the top of your poll, is a slightly longer tour, four full days, and we visit the Brex for stone curlews and singing woodlarks and breeding tree pipits and breeding spotted fly catchers and some very rare plants and all sorts of other things. That, and the same day we visit the the fens for cranes and for bitterns and hobbies and cuckoos and marsh harries and bearded tits. Norfolk in early summer. Oh, two. We've got two early summers there. Um, That's so, right. So, yeah. so it should be early, late summer and early. I don't know which one's which. Shall we say that the second <laughs> one should be late summer? That 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 that's um that's courtesy of Sue. Thanks for that, Sue. Um, let's <laughs> assume that <laughs> just uh, offload the blame. Let's assume that the top one is Norfolk in early summer, and the middle one or the one below that is uh, Norfolk in late summer. So, if you're ticking the second box, what you're signing up to hear about is the extraordinary phenomenon of the um, massed flocks of waders coming off the wash, which really is. Um, quite, quite phenomenal. It, it, it's one of the, I've had the privilege of watching wildlife all over the world, and it is up there with every spectacle I've ever witnessed. Plus, at that time of year, you just don't know what you're going to see. So in the past, for the birders, we've seen such rarities as brown shrike, palaces, warbler, we've seen red flanked blue tail. So there's a, a great diversity of species. So that second box is Norfolk in late summer, which we actually also run into the autumn. And that is focused around the highest of high tides um, at the wash, which gives us the opportunity to see that spectacle. And then Norfolk in late winter, is focused on displaying goshawks, hawfinches also in the Brex. That's a great time of year to visit the coast for coastal waders, to visit the wash for the wintering waterfowl and waders. So it's a wonderfully diverse exploration. And then, Dan, do you want to say something about the Festival of British Wildlife, which is taking place at Agus in the Scottish Highlands? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have exclusive use of the Agus estate, which is a, a wonderful setting up in the Scottish Highlands, about an hour's drive from Inverness. Um, and Nick, uh, along with myself, uh, Nick Baker, Mike Dilger, Brett Charman, uh, Emma Healy, will all be going up there uh, to host our Festival of British Wildlife, um, which will entail a whole range of uh, wildlife-based activities, both on site and in the surrounding area. So excursions out to the West Coast, to the East Coast, um, up into the glens and stuff. Um, it's an amazing trip. Uh, fabulous variety of, of birds and mammals and, and flora. Um, so Nick will be joining us for that uh, next year as well. And that, that will be operating in late May. Um, so yes, do look out for that one. It's a, it's a very can, good trip. I can get just as excited about Scottish glens and their wildlife and flora and birds and of course the wonderful coastal wildlife right up to common bottlenose dolphins as I can about the wildlife of my native Norfolk. Yeah the, the combination of yourself Nick Baker and, and Mike Dilger um, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm on that trip I think. At almost painful levels. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nick, whilst people are um, expressing their interests in travel plans and so forth, um, I have got a few questions for you. Please, and please. One of them uh, relates to the physicality of these trips. Um, how, how tough are these trips? Um, how fit do you need to be? 
they're not very tough at all. The, I suppose, in a way, the toughest physically is Norfolk in, let me get this right, late summer, so the, the washed one. The reason for that is we have to walk out um, probably in excess of a kilometre from the car park at first light. Now, it's hugely worth it, but it's you're walking on shingle pretty much in the dark because you've got to be there for first light. And so that's probably the most demanding. All of the rest of them we take at a pretty gentle pace and we don't do any very severe walks. Even the Snesham walk, the, the Norfolk in late summer one, isn't a, a mighty walk. It's just that I do need to get you all up. The best tides are at dawn. And so I need to get you up very, it's absolutely worth it but it does involve a little bit more walking very early in the morning. But the rest of them are all at a pretty gentle pace. We do, of course, like to explore as far as we can, but most of the nature reserves are ones where there's a visitor centre or there are seats. So if anybody did feel they wanted to walk half of a walk that we were doing, we never do a whole day's walk. We always divide the day into two. And if somebody felt they'd walked enough and they wanted to sit by themselves and watch the dragonflies, watch the flowers, take some photos, ask me later if they've got any questions about what they've photographed, we can plan that into our day. So I'll always have a, a backup plan of how I can accommodate those who want to go a little bit further and those who want to stay back a little bit nearer the visitor centre or on a bench, and we'll make sure that we pick you up on the way back. Brilliant. So as long as you're able to do like a couple of kilometres over the course of the day at a nice slow pace, Absolutely. Fine. Absolutely. None of them is a, a big slogging up hills. We don't have hills in Norfolk. We used to have hills. We got bored of them. We got rid of them in order to deliver fantastically accessible tours. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Also, I mean, just to add as well, if, if anybody is going to struggle to do that as well, then we absolutely can set this up for them privately as well. And, and you can take them out and and do as much or as little as they want and stuff and see the site. So um, and, very And on the subject of the Norfolk in late summer tour, if anyone really would struggle with the walk, the RSP, I don't think there would be a way of doing this on the main tour, mm -hmm. but with sufficient notice, we can actually ask for disabled parking from the RSPB on the reserve, and then you're only a short walk, really 100 metres, from the place where it all happens. But there's only parking for a couple of vehicles there. So those spaces are booked up. And there's no way we could do that with the big vehicle with all of the with all of our of our groups. So we have to assume that everybody on the Norfolk in late summer tour is able to do the walk. But if anyone wanted to do that as a private departure, with enough time in advance, the team at RSPB Titchwell and Snettersham are extremely friendly and helpful and accommodating, and we could work on making that a possibility. Brilliant. Nice one, Nick. And obviously, it's going to be really useful if people have got binoculars and stuff with them, but you'll also have a scope with you as well for these trips. I, I will do. We never go anywhere without a scope, um, which I'll carry and we'll set up. Obviously, there'll be days when we're really kneeling on our knees looking at flowers and insects when we won't be carrying a scope. But anywhere where we're in open country, where we might see a marsh harrier perched on a, on a bush or we might see um, a flock of ducks on a marsh, then we'll always have a telescope with us and everybody is welcome to use it whenever they want to. Great stuff. Nice one, Nick. Um, I've got a few more questions for you. Um, Barry has asked, what is the best time for the goshawks? He's, he's particularly... The best time for goshawk is definitely late winter. Yeah. Um, because So goshawk displays really any time from now on a bright, clear day, goshawks get up and display. But... If you want to see a range of other things like the, the hawfinches as they gather in their roosts and the firecrest when they begin to sing and the woodlarks when they begin to sing and the stone curlies when they come back to their breeding sites, then you've got to time the goshawks. So we can do goshawks for you right the way through the winter. We just need bright, clear weather because they'll display right through winter. But February, late February, mid-February, late February is absolutely peak for displaying goshawk. Brilliant. Good man. Thank you. Um, we've also just had another question just come in, just 
on what um, the private trips would include. But the, the private trips, if we do those for people, we can design them exactly to their requirements, you know, whatever the target species are. So any of the stuff which you've mentioned today, um, you know, can be incorporated into it. Absolutely. And they can also, if your particular interest were the flora of the salt marshes, then you could go in July, but still visit the tern colonies and sea seals. And or you'd be highly likely still to see marsh harries and bitterns and things in the broads if you were to go. So you essentially, if it lives in Norfolk, we can provide private dates. Now, we base our we base our group tours with, um, at a hotel that's just outside Kings Lynn because it's extremely convenient, both for the surrounding habitats, the, especially in winter, the, the winter roosts of Hen Harry's Marsh, Harry's Merlins and so on. And we have seen Great Grey Shrike, in fact, in those roosts on one of the tours. And it's phenomenally convenient also for the summer night jars because they're right next to the hotel. But we also can, on a private departure, we have small hotels right the way around Norfolk. So if you were interested, particularly in Broadland, we could place you much closer to Broadland, which would be less of a commute to get there. So for small private departures, we can be greatly more flexible and put you very, very close to the thing that you particularly want to see. Brilliant. Nice one, Nick. Um, a, a comment, a question here from uh, Anonymous. Um, Anonymous. It's always good oh. fun. Uh, is it commonplace to rub uh, fen nettles on your face? Um, is this uh, a common practice in Norfolk? And, and is it, it is a common to practice. your youthful good looks? It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is a common practice in Norfolk. And um, but there's a sort of um, there's an apprenticeship when you can't tell stinging nettle from common nettle, and you have to beat yourself across the face <laughs> with nettles until you have learned. Uh, no, I just rub fen nettles on my face to freak my clients out. Good, good. I mean, you'd never think that you were 65. You, you, no, you, you wouldn't. You don't, you you don't wouldn't. look a day over 55, honestly. No, no, that's true. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's been a you're, pleasure. You're very welcome. Um, Especially not having worked with you for 20 years, you really wouldn't <laughs> think I was... Um, Nick, we, we should just make a little bit more reference to your book as well. Um, I've got a copy here. Um, Nick is a very talented chap, as we can all see uh, and have all heard this evening. And he's written a book about geese, um, The Meaning of Geese, uh, which is about Nick's. Well, you, t you, you give a quick summary, Nick. You're, you're much better yes. place for it than me. Thank you very much, Dan. So, yes, uh, Dan's modelling the, the cover. I'm very lucky to have a phenomenal cover designed by Holly Ovenden. Um, I cycled for seven months through the lockdowns of 2020 into 21, the winter lockdowns. And because for many of us, it was a strange, isolated time when work wasn't reliable and things like that, I decided I was going to write a book about the geese. I decided, really, I was going to become a goose and so I spent every free day when the weather wasn't too bad out with the geese and during the process of that winter I wanted not just to write about the geese but to understand the environment that the geese inhabit and the people that live alongside the geese and love the geese and who farm the land the geese feed on in some cases all also the wildfowlers the people who shoot the geese and what impact that has on the geese and the impacts that climate change and other threats are having on the geese and so I spoke to a fabulous diversity of goose enthusiasts and goose nuts and goose um, followers and I wrote their story so really the book is about what the geese mean in a changing landscape in a changing climate and what they mean to me as someone who's grown up in North Norfolk um, and who has lived always every winter of my Norfolk life in the sound of the, the pink footed geese fly over me every morning at the moment at eight o'clock on the dot they go to feed in a field which is a mile in that direction where they're feeding on harvested maize and so i'm i'm roused from my house at eight o'clock every morning um when i rush out into the garden to greet the pink footed geese and that is what the book is about and I'm very grateful to both Wildlife Worldwide and to my publisher, Chelsea Green, because they've arranged a discount code for clients of the uh, of Wildlife Worldwide and the Travelling Naturalist. Yeah, so just a quick note on that. Um, we will send a follow-up email tomorrow, which will include a link for a 25% discount on Nick's book. 
Um, and uh, so do you know be sure to take advantage of that. Um, as you can see on your screens at the moment, uh, if you want to join Nick on any of his trips or indeed the, the two of us on the Festival of British Wildlife, there is a discount available. So if you fancy any of those trips, uh, have a read of the travel plans and um, just give us a shout and quote the discount code that you can see at the moment. We will remind you of that tomorrow in the email as well. And then just to remind everybody that we've got another talk next week um, with Mike Dilger, a good friend of Nick and I, um, and he'll be talking about Scotland from seas to the summits. Um, so, yeah, I think, Nick, we're, 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 oh, we've got, hold on. I think we're just about there on the questions. If any more do come in, um, we can obviously pick them up in the morning and respond on email. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Nick, for an exceptional talk. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking to join you on one of these. We've been talking about it for years. But I, I, I need to come along and, uh, and see some of this stuff for myself. Um, I know that Norfolk's nearly as good as Suffolk, and uh, and Suffolk's obviously very special. So uh, <laughs> I will um, definitely try and make that happen. But um, I'll let everybody get on with their evening. Thank you again, Nick. Uh, you've been an absolute star. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good evening. Thanks, to everybody. A real pleasure to speak to you all this evening. And I look forward to seeing you either in Scotland in the summer of next year or indeed in my native Norfolk. And the dates are available now for both 2024 and 2025. So come see the knots, come see the swallowtails, come see the cranes, come see the fabulous diversity of wildlife of my native Norfolk. Thanks, Nick. Good night. Bye-bye.